Well, it seems that whenever I stand before you, I always go to gushing. So let me gush for a moment and say that it's, there have been two major feasts which have gone by, Christmas and Easter, and it was a sheer delight to my soul and to the soul of my family to be able to return back here to Christ in St. Luke's from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and to find this place to be such a refuge for our souls and spirits. Thank you so much for being one of those beautiful homes in our hearts. So I'm going to invite you to take out your bulletin and mark it up just a little bit with me this morning. And I'll tell you why. I'll clue you in. So if you've got something to write with, there might be a pencil in the pew. I'll give you a second to reach for something there. And then if you'd open it up so that you're looking at the opening of the trifold right in front of you. At the very top left, you will have the words, Father's House, which will be the piece from Samuel. And we're going to go down just to the end of that first major paragraph. Looking over to the right, finding David playing his lyre. And just after it says the word liar, it will say, as he did day by day. Can you find that with me? All right. As he did day by day. Circle it, mark it, underline it. If you don't have anything to write with, just visualize it. And just mark that place there. Then come down to the next paragraph. The very tail end of that next paragraph. David had success in all his undertakings for the Lord was with him. Success in all his undertakings because the Lord was with him. Then if you could skip over the psalm, beautiful psalm, come down into 2 Corinthians, please, and let your eyes glance down about six lines down, now is the day of salvation. Circle it, please, underline it, mark it with your eyes. Now is the day of salvation, and then all the way to the very end of that text, open wide your hearts also. Am I going too fast? Okay, great. Then just one more, and I'm not going to preach a full sermon on each of these texts. <laughs> just want to have it before you. And then if you could look at the gospel, let your eyes go down about two-thirds of the way through and see Jesus saying, Peace be still. Please mark that visually with your pen. My hope is that by marking those texts, as you go away today and you bring your bulletin with you, maybe go back to your scriptures through the course of the week, drinking your coffee and, and, and digging into the scriptures, that even if you take no other notes throughout the course of the sermon, by looking back over, over those phrases, you'll be able to recall anything from the sermon that you'd like to recall. Try it. See if it works. Let me know. Happy Father's Day, dads out there. Happy Father's Day. And if you're not a father, please don't check out of the sermon. Because we know the things that cause people to check out of sermons, because we all listen to a lot of sermons as well. We want to acknowledge out there that there are first-time fathers probably with us. There are children who said goodbye to their fathers this year. There are fathers who said goodbye to children. And there are plenty of unreconciled father-child relationships. I had a Marine sit in my office this week and refer to his biological father as my sperm donor. He could not refer to that person as father. So he substituted those words each time he made reference to him. No matter who you are, I intend to include you in this sermon, and I encourage you to daydream. This is just a simple summer Sunday, and it's going to be just fine so long as I don't mess it up, and I hope I don't. So feel free to think of your fathers or your mothers or your children or friendships, or think of the members of Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, who are also in our hearts today, and we rang the bells for them this morning at 10 o'clock. I suppose that I began this sermon 
on May 17th, when I had the privilege of preaching at our Camp Lejeune Chapel. It was in that between space between Mother's Day and Father's Day, and my text for the day was John 17, the prayer of the Son Jesus to the Heavenly Father. I was preparing for what I hoped would be an epic motorcycle ride with my 81-year-old dad. Really, what I was hoping and praying was that we would pull it off, <laughs> which we did. And at the time, I was absolutely struck by the line I had read many times before when Jesus says to the Father in verse 10 of John 17, all I have is yours and all you have is mine. And I came to the realization of how clearly this spoke to my relationships, both with my father and with my mother. My mom, Mary Ann, left to be with the Lord in 2005, and sure enough, all she had became mine. The whole of it. And some of you know what this means. My sisters, God bless them, selected a few things they desired to have with them, and they kindly, and I think they really were kind, indicated that I could have the rest. All she had was mine. That was certainly a storm in which Jesus had to speak calm. And it was only last Labor Day when I finally moved all of those things from dilapidated cardboard boxes, which had been hastily packed and moved several times into permanent rubber-sealed tubs. Every item was transferred. Many were grieved over. And our relationship was deepened, a relationship which was already reconciled. My dad trucks on, which is, which is wonderful. With his good bit of energy, only made greater by riding motorcycles. We got snookered out of our ride last fall and that disappointment, that disappointment motivated us through the winter and the months of planning for three days and two nights in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The motorcycle he rides in Michigan is his, and it is mine. I purchased it, registered it in my name, and insured it, but it's all his. To the last day he can ride, he visits my home on the shore and he pours through my possessions, all of which I leave out for his perusal. Not much. Walls crammed with art, shelves crammed with books. And when he and Pam leave to return home, it is my sheer delight to find several volumes still placed randomly around my space. All I have is his. And during those breaks we take on our rides, when we eat at delightful mom and pop breakfast joints, he's free to reflect and amuse and say things like, what am I gonna do with all those tools in my garage? <laughs> to which I can respond, don't worry about it, Dad. I got it. I'll take care of it. All he has is mine. And of course, we're not just speaking of material things. If I can turn a phrase, or if I can make a pie crust, or if I can get through a very formal dinner, it's because all that my mother has is mine. If you hand me a pen or a paintbrush, I can do something with it, because all my father has is mine, including my anger, not only the good stuff. And it took me quite a while to realize I was angry. And when I spoke to my dad about it in my late 20s, early 30s, I found out, you know, he was angry too. And then we found out that my, my grandfather, his dad, was angry. So then it started to make a lot of sense. And you know, the beauty of it is that my son is not angry, and his son wouldn't know what we were talking about. 
the beautiful thing is that even our transformed lives belong to our children. Isn't that wonderful? Thanks be to God for that. So this I've come to see is a sign of fully reconciled relationship. When we enjoy fully reconciled relationship with someone, anyone, we want to give freely of ourselves to them. And when the relationship is not reconciled, we hold back, we sequester, we quarantine, and what we usually hold back becomes moldy and bitter. We give things away when we want a fully reconciled relationship. We want fully reconciled relationships before we die. Here's the catch. We don't know when we're gonna die. 81 years old and he feels it because he's preparing. But let's face it, sometimes our unreconciled relationships seem to us like battles we can't win. Too many years, too much stuff held back, too much bitterness. And all too often, death separates us before we can reconcile. We are like the classic picture of that little shepherd, David, standing before the giant Goliath. But wait a minute, let's recheck that classic idea with the help of Malcolm Gladwell. Have you read his book, David and Goliath, anybody? If you haven't, please check it out. Turns the whole thing on its head. Turns out, kid wasn't all that lucky after all as the underdog. Turns out, he had a skill. Let me quote from Gladwell, please. Ancient armies had three kinds of warriors. The first was cavalry, armed men on horseback or in chariots. The second? was infantry, foot soldiers wearing armor and carrying swords and shields. The third were projectile warriors, or what today would be called artillery, archers, and most importantly, slingers. Slingers had a leather pouch attached on two sides by a long strand of rope. They would put a rock or a lead ball into the pouch and swing it around in increasingly wider and faster circles and then release one end of the rope hurling the rock forward. I've seen it done. I've done it, not so successfully. Slinging, writes Gladwell, took an extraordinary amount of skill and practice. Gladwell will also tell you in the book Outliers that if you want to be good at something, spend 10,000 hours doing it, and then you'll be an expert. David didn't win because he got a lucky shot. He didn't win because he had a sense of holy boldness, which he did. He won because he was a practiced slinger. That thing that you want to be for others, that skill, that attribute, you'll need to practice. For my part, I don't want to be a slinger, but David still inspires me. I've slung all sorts of things, especially in the last seven years. I've slung arrows, pistols, rifles. I've pulled a lanyard on a, hundred, on a 155 artillery piece. Heck, I've even fired a tank just for fun. I went three for four. I'll tell you the story later. But I really have no interest in being a slinger, mostly because no one, neither my children nor my parents, nor the Marines and sailors I serve, none of them needs me to be a slinger. They do need me to be a storm calmer. And for that inspiration, I look to the other one born in the line of the shepherd David and his father Jesse. The skill I need to practice is self-evident. They're always knocking on my door. They're always waking me up at night when my head is on the pillow in the stern. Dad, chaps, wake up. And they expect me to do something, make some difference. 
Say something. Bring calm. Pray. Speak peace. Be still. Just be dad. Chaps. You who want to calm storms, you who want to still waves, you who want to be slingers. You have to do like David did. He practices lyre and he practices sling. Don't always sail on calm days, folks. We can't be fair weather sailors. We need practice. My young friend from Sheridan, Wyoming is at flight school in Pensacola. Takes me through every flight. His solo flights, it's just phenomenal. Now he's learning to fly by instruments. Jake is preparing to bring calm to the storm, learning to trust his gauges. David was practiced in the art of a slinger. Jesus was practiced in the art of calming storms. This was not his first storm he spoke to. He was always telling demons to be silent. Stop raging. I find that most people want me to be a storm calmer. Some actually want me to be a storm creator, but I usually stay away from those people. (laughs) Storm calming takes practice. Practice takes time. And sometimes... We don't have much time left. Or as we say in Wyoming, we're plumb out of time. My goddaughter is a medical resident. She shared these words with me the other night. I don't know why we put so much value into the minute at the end, expending every effort and extraordinary investment into prolonging a life and holding on for two more weeks. Then she said quite profoundly, why don't we lop those two weeks off the end and invest in those two weeks right now? Now is the day of salvation. Now, folks, is the time to practice. Now is the time to open wide your hearts. Amen.